So we are ready to record or we have, we are recording. Okay. Thank you. Good morning, everybody. And welcome to buy better books, which is a four part series from the state library designed to help you improve your collection development skills. The first installment of this series is gonna start with an overview of collection development, and then we'll kind of walk through the process of collection management. So here we go. According to the library director's handbook, collection management is an important library function and involves three major aspects, developing policies for the collection, budgeting for your collection, and then developing strategies for building, leading and maintaining your collection. So this first installment is gonna be organized around those three parts to collection management. So this beginning might be a refresher for some of you, but hang in there, I promise we'll get to some resources in just a few minutes. So after staffing, your collection is your major asset at your library. Collection development is really at the heart of what libraries do. It means being able to meet the needs of individuals with the right stuff. It might be the right book, it might be the best movie, or it might be the perfect audiobook to entertain your whole family on a long drive. Building a collection involves an approach to the selection, maintenance, development, and evaluation of your library materials. Collection development involves building your collection in all the formats that are needed by your community. So today, we're going to start up in that top left with policy. Then we're going to move into that circle in the middle there that we call the life cycle of a book or library item. I use book in, in that case um, just to represent everything. And then finally, we're going to end with disposal. But what I really want to spend the most time here today is on that top blue box called selection. So to start with, your collection development policy has to answer the why, the what, and the how. It's going to include statements about how your items are selected. It's going to include what kinds of topics, formats, and age groups you serve. Your policy should include statements about weeding and the criteria that are going to be applied when you choose your materials. Collection policies are going to specify how you handle donations, how you handle memorial books, and customer complaints. A collection policy determines participation in statewide programs, like do you participate in open access and interlibrary loan? The policy can also indicate if you're going to be part of a consortial agreement or if you house any special collections like local history or genealogy. Another important concept that should be part of your, your policy should be intellectual freedom. This involves protecting the rights of all individuals to pursue the types of information they want and to read anything that interests them. So according to the authors of the book, Policies for Results, any policy should have these three parts, your philosophy, your regulations, and your procedures. So we're gonna start with the first part of the, of the policy, the philosophy. And today I wanna go back to something that's kind of an old school philosophy. This part should answer the why behind the program or the service. And remember, this philosophy is going to be written from the customer's point of view. So while Rankin Nathan's rules can be applied to a broad spectrum of library resources, I think they kind of sum up the underlying philosophy about collection development. These rules have been updated by others. You can see, again, we're talking about books, but we're really talking about library materials. And so they have been updated, but I kind of use the old school ones. So the first one, books are for use. When you're thinking about collection development, that makes total sense. Libraries don't exist to just collect things or protect things. They are to be used. Every reader his book. Collection development means purchasing materials for everyone. Every book its reader. Collection development means purchasing materials that reflect the desires of your community. Save the reader's time. And this fits with collection development because part of that is cataloging and shelving. That's all part of your collection development. People need to be able to find things quickly and easily. And the last one is fairly obvious. A library is a growing organism. This includes the idea of adding to the collection as well as weeding materials. So I think this really does sum up collection development. The second piece of your policy should talk about regulations. 
they are going to answer the what. What needs to be done to support this program or this service that you provide? They're going to be specific written rules of the road. You can kind of think of them as red tape there. We're going to be cutting through that. And these are things that your customers need to know. I especially want to point out evaluation here. I think it's really important that patrons know that we do evaluate. We don't just buy everything and that we're unbiased as we purchase materials. So again, this part is customer facing. So you can talk about your collection scope. What type of formats do you uh, collect? Um, what is your reconsideration policy? And how about things like maintenance? How do we repair things? Do we replace things? Obviously things like weeding and disposal are going to be in the regulation section of your policy. And the last piece are procedures. This is gonna answer the how. How is the staff gonna carry out the service or programs? They are frequently written step-by-step -step instructions that detail the tasks that staff needs to perform to support this service. So it might answer questions like, when we're ready to order, how do we decide what to order? Maybe you'll have some selection criteria listed, listed in your procedures. How do we handle that book of, of that box of books that a patron wants to donate? How do we get rid of things? Garbage, recycle, book sale, online sale? The answers to these questions should absolutely be part of the procedure section of your collection development policy. So now we're going to move on to that second big piece. We kind of talked about policy. Now we're going to head on into budget. So how do you decide how much money to spend on each of your collections? You're going to want to assign a percentage of the library's operating budget to the purchase of library materials. A standard used to be 10 to 15 percent of your total budget, but over time that number has become um, less important. We don't use those quite as, as much as we used to. So let's just say you do decide to spend 12 percent of your budget for materials. There are a lot of types of materials or collections to spend your money on. So one way to think about it is, if fiction represents 20% of your collection, does it also represent 20% of your circulation? And then, does it represent 20% of your budget? Now the question is, should it? You know, Should those numbers all be exactly the same? What about picture books? They tend to be some of the highest circulating materials in the library, but frequently less money is spent on them. And of course, there's a number of factors that influence this, like the price of a picture book, but it is something that you should be thinking about as you work through your budget. For a small library, you might not have a line-by-line -line breakdown. X amount of dollars for audio, X amount of dollars for adult fiction, X amount of dollars for children's uh, pro, uh, books. But it can be really useful to look every so often at these and kind of have some numbers in the back of your mind. What's the percentage of money that you spend on adult materials versus children's materials? How about the difference in what you spend on digital versus print? And don't forget to think about what materials are your patrons actually using. Take a look at the size of your adult nonfiction collection and look at the circulation numbers compared to your adult fiction. And of course, don't forget to allot a certain amount for replacement because of theft and damage. Now we're going to head into that um, cycle the, the collection of collection management strategies, and we're going to start out with selection. So collection management strategies, again, we're going to talk about selection first. So you need to answer a few questions before you actually start the selection process. Make sure these kinds of details are spelled out in that policy in order to prevent a whole lot of frustration and confusion on your part, your staff's part, and the part of the public. So ask the question, who? Who's responsible for building your library's collection? In small libraries, the director handles most of those selection duties. But selecting books and other materials can be a shared task among the staff. They can also be subdivided by format. So maybe one person selects books and somebody else selects electronic formats like DVDs, CDs, or downloadable materials. Next question, what? What goes into your collection? Books, magazines, newspapers, movies, music, electronic resources, cake pans, puzzles, toys, costumes? 
Next, where? Where are you going to buy them? We're going to talk about acquiring materials a little bit later. How? How are items determined for suitability in your collection? There are lots of resources you can use, which again, we'll talk about later, but you should also consider customer recommendations. This can help ensure that the library is meeting the demands of its customers. You shouldn't feel obligated to purchase everything that everybody requests, but they need to, so they do need to fit then with your mission and your selection development policy. When? Do you have a timeline for purchase and cataloging? How long does it take a bestseller to get to your shelf? Do you buy a book when only one person asks for it? Or do you need to have a request from more than one? And finally, why? This goes back to your philosophy. Why is it important to add this item to your collection? Because of that issue of budget, we can't afford to buy everything, all libraries face complex challenges in their choices. Listed here are just a few of the issues in collection development that you need to keep in mind. These ideas are going to play into the decisions as we start talking about selection. Each of these categories could be its own hour. So I'm not going to go into each of these now, but we will come back to the second one there, popular materials versus classics. So along with budget, small and rural libraries have always faced unique challenges. Things like limited staff and time constraints. If you have only one person who's performing all the library functions, collection development is just a tiny part of what they do. Another problem that libraries have frequently are too many, especially in small and rural areas, too many inappropriate and unsolicited gifts, and then limited space. And this can certainly be a problem in more than just small and rurals. So good collection development practice is going to start with an understanding of your community, finding ways in which the library can best meet the current needs of its potential users. You probably already base your selection decisions on what you know your users' tastes and backgrounds are. But what about those non-users, the rest of your community? The library's missions, goals, and objectives can help focus the collection even further. In order to address some of those challenges, we need to set priorities. So first ask yourself, do you know your community? For example, do you know, how is your community changing? What's happening to the socioeconomic status? What's happening in demographics, employment trends, development plans? Another question, do you know, are your physical facilities adequate for providing the types of services and materials that are needed by your citizens? What types of materials and information would best help your community as a whole to reach their vision? Who are the local authors, artists, community decision makers? What businesses and nonprofits are in your community? What are the annual community events that you have every year? All of these things give us information about our, what our community needs and wants and can help inform those selection priorities. Um, the last one, I think, one of the most important ones are think about what are your community's expectations regarding the library? What role does the library play in the community? And what role should the library play in your community? And I cannot do a webinar on collection development or any type of collection management without this slide. So if you guys have seen my weeding ones or any of the other collection developments, I guarantee you've already seen this, but I think it's such an important topic. I like to, to repeat it every time. So thinking back to those gifts and donations, this is what your patrons think they are giving you. This lovely gift of, of things that you surely need because you're so underfunded. This is more the reality of what you get when you get those donations. So just remember, Nothing is actually free. You can just say no to unsolicited, inappropriate, and costly gifts. You do have to do some kind of processing and cataloging. So even if the item is free, adding it to your collection is not. You want to think about condition, appropriate formats, age, and the entire collection. Donations can be used to add extra copies of popular materials or to replace items that are worn out or out of print. 
Except under special circumstances, though, donated items should not be used as the primary source of new titles being added to your collection, unless they're specifically purchased at the request of the library. When somebody donates a bestseller from several years ago, most of your patrons wanted it when it was new, not two years later. Quality versus demand can also be talked about as demand versus classics. And I thought maybe this issue was kind of resolved in libraries today because I think a lot of libraries are looking at what it is that people need and want and sort of purchasing that way. But every once in a while, I get a question from a librarian or I see a pop up on Library Talk. What do I do with all these classics that we have sitting on our shelves? So I did want to bring this up just a little bit. The demand argument of this, you know, quality versus demand, says that because public libraries are funded by taxpayers, libraries should be providing taxpayers with the type of materials they want. A collection based on demand may result in more bestseller type books that are heavily influenced by popular culture instead of a collection of classics. Some argue that this kind of collection will draw people into the library since the library contains what they want. Then, once you've got them in there, you can assist them in expanding their horizons if they're interested. The quality argument of this argument says that a public library should be a people's university, providing people with materials to help better themselves. And all of our resources should be geared towards improving people, meaning provide the classics. What does this mean as we look at our fiction collections? Back in the 80s and 90s, Charlie Robinson, who then was director at the Baltimore County Public Library, took a very controversial view and said we should forgo the classics and a lot of the normal nonfiction, whoops, sorry about that, and provide people with what they asked for, meaning mostly fiction and high interest only nonfiction. Hopefully, most public libraries are going to strive for a mix of the two of these selection philosophies. Your ultimate goal is to provide a balanced collection that meets the needs of your community. Now that we got some of those philosophical questions about selection out of the way, let's get down to some of the practical. This used to be my favorite way to purchase material materials when I was a library selector. I rarely used review sources, even though that's what we were taught in library school, because my library was part of that give them what they want camp. I, I loved using the coming attractions catalogs from my book vendors. It included things like the print run, which can be a good indicator of popularity. So now if I do this right, I want to take you out here um, I'm showing you um, on the screen here, Ingram and Baker and Taylor. I couldn't find a way to look at the Baker and Taylor um, coming attractions or the, the content things. Theirs, I think, is called Forecast is one of the ones that they use. Ingram's is called Advance. So I want to actually take you out, see if I can do this, and show you in case you've not seen this before, um, the Ingram content things. Like I said, this was my favorite way to do it. So I'm just out here. For some reason, they use a program or a web service called FlipSnack. And so they've got, hopefully you can see this, all of these um, catalogs that they've got out here that you can look at. One of the ones I want to show you right now is this um, advanced. That's the one that I used to use the most. So the April, the things that are coming out in April were actually published in this advanced catalog on February 21st. So you've got a good six weeks prior to the materials coming out to know what's going to be coming out. Um, I put this together before the April one came out. So I want to just quickly show you the March advance. And for those of you who've not used these before so that you can kind of see um, how useful they are. So again, this is the um, March one. And I think, so there's tons and tons of ads, which are always great fun to look through. But then they've also got, um, so here's all the things they have. They also have articles in here, which can, I, I know I've got one here someplace. There we go. So um, this is an excerpt from one of the books that they're highlighting here today. They've also got, um, oh, there's some more uh, article or uh, 
ads that they've got in here, some more excerpts that they've got in here. So let me go to, this is going to be a little tricky here. So this is what it looks like when you actually, whoop, when you actually, well, that didn't help very much, did it? Sorry about that. So you'll see the cover, which is always helpful when you're purchasing things. You see a little description of it. You see a price. You've got the ISBN as well as the, the Ingram code, and they've got them categorized. So if you keep going, this one, I'm sure you probably can't read it because I can barely read it on my screen. There's a section for, there are two titles in Animals and Pets. There's one on antiques and collectibles. So fiction starts on page 60-something, oh, I think. Cooking and Wine is one of their um, catalogs. So now we've got the general fiction, and they've got pages and pages of what's coming out in March in general fiction. And again, it can tell you on some of the high ones what the print run is going to be. You know if Ingram is is if the publisher is printing this and Ingram is buying that many copies of it, they anticipate this to be a hugely popular book. So this was a way that, you know, I could take this catalog home and go through and circle the things that we want, come back to the library and, you know, upload them into a cart. A lot of this is online now and depending on what you subscribe to, you have access to a lot of other ways to do it, but I find this to be really a great way to do it. It breaks it down into regular um, hardcovers, and then at the end, they've got a section on paperbacks. They've also got you know sections for kids as well as whole catalogs that are just for kids. So I found this to be a really great way to do that. All right, let's go back to the PowerPoint. Oops, I want to pull that down. All right, so here is, oh, um, I want to I want to read a really quote before I move on to the next one about about kind of where I'm headed with all of this. This is something that I read um, in a blog post about selecting books. This woman said, the reason I no longer use just official review sources like Library Journal or Public we Public Publishers Weekly is now that our readers surf the web, listen to talk radio and watch book programs on C-SPAN. They're requesting books that they wouldn't have known about in the past. Their recreational interests are expanding too. So as a book selector for a medium small public library, not having the budget to buy indiscriminately, I need to identify the books with a buzz. I need to notice the books that our readers will notice and I want to do it before they do if possible. And I think that sort of sums up the philosophy that, that I kind of have about this now. You know, those review sources are great, but if my patrons want the new John Grisham, I, I could care less what some professional critic says about that. So tapping into these resources that help you find out what's got a buzz right now and what your patrons are hearing about is kind of the best way. So that's sort of where we're headed with these next slides. At some point when I was putting together some collection development um, resources, I signed up for a whole bunch of emails. So all of the things on this screen come to my inbox right now. Most of them are newsletters. Some just promote their new titles. Some of them are actually promoting webinars that you can sit in on and watch. Sometimes it's the author talk about their new book that's coming up. Sometimes it's the publisher who talks about a specific genre. Here are the new cozy mysteries we have coming up for the month of March. So these are just a tiny, tiny percentage of the ones that, that I found. And another thing that I think is really helpful is following those publishers on Facebook. So the couple that I've got up here, um, the Penguin Random House marketing newsletter is called Morning Book Buzz. And again, that comes to my inbox, you know, maybe as often as once a week. And it's just telling you about the things that are, that are coming up. Um, Alma comes, it's called Alma Book Buzz. And that is a webinar that they do, and it's from the Adult Library Marketing Association. That's the Alma piece. And they have webinars of all the upcoming titles, so multiple publishers, and those have been really good. Um, Workman Publishing, again, is just another tiny example here, has a newsletter of all the titles that are coming up called the Workman Update. 
um, Library Love Fest, which I just think is a hysterical title, that actually comes out of the HarperCollins marketing team. And they put together a newsletter that comes out with, with all of the new titles that are coming up. Scholastic, of course, is always coming up with things. Um, so pick your favorite publishers and sign up for some of those. I do have a handout that I've prepared with the last couple of slides and the next one's coming up that has all of the things on the slides here, as well as a link either to the general page or to the page where you can sign up for some of these uh, newsletters and the things that are out there. I don't know what to call this category, so I'm sort of calling them aggregators. Um, there may be a better word out there, but I haven't really come, come up with it. Again, most of these come directly to my inbox. Some of them do have a paid component, component like Library Journal, Book List, or Publishers Weekly, but they also, also have really good free resources on those same sites. Early Word is one that I really like. It's the home of something called Galley Chat, which is a monthly online discussion where library staff share their excitement about upcoming books. Booklist has a whole ton of things, and what I ended up putting on the sheet for that is all of the newsletters that you can sign up for under Booklist. Again, it's something you could subscribe to, but they've also got some free things that are out there. Um, Webca Webcast Alert is the, the library journal one. And again, it comes right to your, to your inbox, and so you can see what all those forthcoming things are. Oops, sorry, wrong page. Um, and then I also want to talk about um, podcasts. Don't forget about those. I just did a generic collection development podcast search, and I found a ton of them to, to check out. All the Books is one that comes from Book Riot, which I'm going to talk about in a second on the, the next slide here. But then there's one called What Should I Read Next? And that's one that you can find in Apple Podcasts. It may be available elsewhere, but that was where I um, found that. So, you know, again, these are places that aren't specifically publishers. Sometimes they have a paid component, but it's, you know, like the Library Journal one says, books that are buzzing. It's a way to find out about what's coming up and what is it that people are talking about. Book clubs is another category that I don't think I used when I was a book selector, but as I started um, doing a book club with a, with a group of people just sort of on my own, not as a librarian, I started doing research on what was out there and came up with a ton of places. You know, we all know the Oprah Book Club or the GMA or I don't remember who all the other famous people are that, that have their book clubs. And certainly that's one way to get access to new and buzzy titles. But there are actually some that do um, a little bit more than just that. Book Riot is one of them that has a whole host of services that are out there. Um, there's another one um, up in the, oh, the, the bottom square one called Book Clubs. And what they say about theirs is as avid book club readers, we relish the excitement of discovering fresh voices to introduce to our members. What a great tool for you as a selector then. They say each year we share a collection of debut authors, which that's sometimes kind of hard to find. You know, we all know our favorites. We know our patrons' favorites. But how do we find those books that it's the first one that the, that the person has published? How do we find those? This is a great way to do that. Um, so they've got lists, and all of these places have lists. You can go back through, through previous years and get the information that way. So I like all of these. I've... I've used them extensively. Here's what I kind of call some of the standards. Um, you may remember if you've been around in the state for a while, the state library provided novelist for public libraries for a while. Um, that became prohibitively expensive and we ended up going with Gale Books and Authors and we provided that for a couple of years. Unfortunately, that was not used very much by our librarians. So when we had to kind of evaluate the cost versus how many people were using it, we also had to drop um, Gale. These are things that you can subscribe to on your own. And I do know there are a lot of libraries in the state that are that are providing that for their patrons. Um, the, the I put the picture up here of the Children's Core Collection, but Wilson has a whole series of core collections. And um, we did provide that also for, for a while and we're not providing that, but you can get these in print from the state library. We own them. You can check them out and borrow them 
from the State Library if you'd like to take a look at those. And again, it's a way, um, these aren't just the new titles that are coming out, but it's a nice way to look for holes in your collection um, as you're selecting and you're going back, especially for nonfiction, I think, although technically we're talking fiction today, but it's a way to kind of go back and make sure that you're not missing things. And so I think those are, are also really useful. And then book page, um, again, is kind of a semi-professional thing that you can subscribe to. If you don't know about book page, it's something that you can purchase to give out to your friends. It's sort of a, to your friends, to your patrons. It's um, sort of a newspaper format that you can just put out and people pick, pick up and can take home and use. This was so popular in my former library that I would have people come in and they'd have them all circled and they'd say, I want this one, I want this one, I want this one. And that's what they did to, to do their holds. So once I started seeing that as a selector, I just took that and went through and said, yep, they're going to ask for this. They're going to ask for this. They're going to ask for this. And that was another tool that I used. And yes, it is. Um, I think there's a minimum of 50 that you have to buy. And so it is a subscription that you have to pay for. Um, but they also have free things on their online page. So you can actually see bits and pieces of that and get some of the reviews. So again, I think that's a really great one that everybody should be aware of. All right. How am I doing on time? Oh, we're looking pretty good. And this is something I'm not going to spend time on here because I spent a whole lot of time putting together a three-page handout of the major book awards. So they are organized on this handout by month. So during the month of, let's see, I've got during the month of January is when the Andrew Carnegie Medal in excellence uh, for excellence in fiction that's when that comes out. So I've got that linked to their website so that you can go out in January and see what those new ones are. In March, the Penn America Literary Awards come out. In March, the Audi Awards come out. Those are for um, audiobooks. Um, the Edgars come out in April, which is Mysteries. The Bram Stoker, which is, which is uh, uh, horror titles that are coming out. So I really like using these book award lists. Um, again, it's for the new things that have come out in the past year, but then you can go back and look at some of the old ones to see if there are things that you've missed. And again, to sort of look at some of those holes. So I, I really like using uh, book awards as a way to do selection. So where do we find information about diversifying our collections? I did a little bit of digging and I found a few places, but most of them focus on youth collections. And I couldn't find anything with a focus specifically on adult fiction. So I'm hoping if there's somebody in the audience that has some place um, that you found adult fiction, um, places where you can go and, and find some diverse things, you know, please share those in the comments and I'd be happy to add them to the, the handout that I've got. Um, there are some paid versions of things that you can do. There's something called Mackin Collection Analysis. There's something you can purchase called Collection HQ. And then Ingram has something called iCurate Inclusive. And these are all products, again, that you pay for, um, but it can help you as you're looking to diversify. They evaluate your collection and then they give you suggestions of things that you can do, again, to sort of help fill those holes. Um, I really like um, the CCBC, which I can't read this on my thing here, the Cooperative Children's Book Center, which comes out of the University of um, Wisconsin in Madison, and they have a really great section on diverse resources. And so if you look in the little drop down there that I, that I pulled up, you can see a whole section on diverse resources. And then we've got the, book verse, the Diverse Book Finder, which is a comprehensive collection of children's picture books that feature Black and Indigenous people and people of color. They have cataloged and analyzed trade picture books that fit the criteria that have been published since 2002. So there's an online searchable database that makes it easy to locate and explore children's picture books featuring those BIPOC characters. Another one that I really like is We Need Diverse Books. They're a 501c3 nonprofit and kind of grassroots organization basically made up of children's book lovers, but they advocate changes in the publishing industry to produce and promote literature that reflects and honors the lives of young people. 
I really like this one, We Need Diverse Books, because it really focuses on the publishers. So instead of just, you know, looking at how libraries are going to be able to diversify, it really focuses on those publishers and make sure that they are working towards diversification. This is another one I'm going to take you out and show you, show you one of these. This slide um, really talks about those best of lists. You tend to see these in November and December of every year. So NPR says these were the best books of 2003. New York Times, besides their regular bestseller list, will put together these are the best books of 2023. I think I said 2003. Yeah, 2023 is what I'm talking about. The one I want to take you out and show you today is something called The Large-Hearted Boy. And I have to give credit to Roy Kanegi, who turned me on to this through one of his Facebook posts. So let's see if I can get out because it sounds so crazy. Um, so when you go to this one, this is what you're going to see. This is a guy off the streets who enjoys music and books, and he likes to curate. So he's doing reviews and all kinds of things um, about books and that. So what I want you to take a look at here are the features. And then when you scroll down to some of his features, you see this one called Lists from 2023. I want to show you this one first. The, the lists from 20, 2002 to 2023 are um, books and music, again, from, from the past year. But what he did is he pulled every single best of list that he could find. And you are going to be astounded at the number of best of lists that are that are out there. And so I really love this. It used to come in spreadsheet form. He's got it a little bit easier. So I'm going to use a list from 2023 because uh, you got to scroll down um, to get to this. So here he used to do all of them and there were a thousand best of lists that he came up with. So now he's kind of trimmed it down a little bit and he's doing the essential and interesting best of book lists. But this is his trimmed down version. When I click on this, here's the list. There is the, the uh, some bird organization has put together their favorite bird books. And so uh, the, uh, the organization, my I beg your pardon, the organization is called 10,000 Birds and they have put together a list of their favorite bird books. Um, Airmail has put out, I don't even know what that is, has put out a list of their best books. Um, Audiophile, you probably have heard um, of that, that magazines. Here's the list of the Audiophile book, best books from there. We have Barack Obama's favorite books from 2023. We have um, the Boston Globe books. You have the New York Times, he's got all of their different ones that they've got out here. The Digital Camera World, I'm presuming, is a magazine, and they have put out the best photography books. So he has curated all of these best of lists. So it, it breaks it down into these tiny, tiny little things. So I just thought this was great fun to kind of go out and look at and see what's, um, what's out there. So let's go back. And here's our next one then. And these are ones that I think you've probably all um, heard of Amazon and Goodreads, obviously. Um, one of the things I did want to remind you, don't forget, you know, we've got the, the Amazon up here with their customer reviews, but they also do editorial reviews. So you can see bits and pieces from some of those ones that you have to subscribe to, like Kirkus or Library Journal or uh, Publishers Weekly. Um, they've got little bits and pieces. So I use that as I'm thinking about um, reviewing books as well. So both pieces of Amazon, I think, are really helpful. And Goodreads, of course, too. The last one I want to take you out and show you, if you are not familiar with fantastic fiction, and again, if you've been doing this a while, you probably know about this, um, but I think it's such a really great resource that I want to show everybody. Um, so I hate their background. I don't know why they've got these really dark colors up here. Uh, for me, it's really hard to read, but it's been that way forever. And I want to say this came out of the UK in the beginning, um, but I'm not positive about that. So fantastic fiction has a whole lot of things. They mostly came about to put things um, in series order. That was kind of how they started, but now they have a whole lot of other things. I'm going to search in a second here. 
But if you scroll all the way down to the bottom, they've got genre pages. So if you want to know more about cozy mysteries and who some of those authors are that do it, Fantastic Fiction is free. Anybody can go out there and use it. You can turn your patrons onto it if you've got, you know, cozy mystery lovers. But it's also really good for librarians, I think, to find out what's what's out there. So, you know, head out to some of those pages and take a look. So if you think about the J.D. Robb series, the, the In Death series, there's 58, I think. Let's see. Yep. Book 58 is coming out this month. So I just typed in the author. I hit find. Um, now there's a little bit about J.D. Robb. You can read a little bit more about here. Here's the things that she has that are coming up. She's got one that just came out in January. She's got another one coming out in September. And here's the series in order. So it started with Naked in Death in 1995. You can click on that and get information about that book as well. So again, this is a great one to turn your um, readers on to. Um, but it might also then create a little bit more work for you as a selector because now they're going to find out about a lot of these things. But when they come to you and want to know, you know, what's the what's the order that that I should be reading this in depth um, series in, you can send them to this. You can look up the things here and get the all of them in order. And they'll even do things like seven and seven point five, twelve and twelve point five. So let's go back. That was my last little field trip there. All right, so a few more resources in our selection here. Don't forget to check out other libraries. Um, find your favorite libraries. I, I pulled up the, the Carnegie Stout one. They have a staff review page where the staff will pull up theirs. A lot of libraries have that. So again, to kind of find out what people are thinking about, what people are, are talking about, what other librarians are doing. A lot of libraries also have this one down here, this the staff picks. So I pulled up the Davenport Public Libraries. They actually did a best of. Here's our staff picks from 2023. Oh, and excuse me here for a second, I need to. <laughs> All right, and then the other one, again, pick your favorites. Take Find a library that's got some staff that are reviewing things on a regular basis and take a look at what they've got. You know, put a little bookmark in there. Get if they if they do the, um, uh, where, where it will automatically come to you. We've added something new to this page. Um, that's a great way to do it. The name just went right out of my head there. Um, another one that I wanna show you here, this is a, a very specific library called the Kent District Library. And they put together, so this one is actually put together by librarians, and it's called What Next? Books in Series. And they have put together a database that, again, helps you search series fiction. So Fantastic Fiction is a good place to go. If you're looking for something a little bit more professional, What's Next from the Kent District Library is another really great place to, to check out. Web Junction, of course, hopefully you're all familiar with that. They have tons of articles and info, but I want you to go to their course catalog. So I looked under collection management and then I went to their course catalog and they have about 37 different categories of courses that you can look up. Under that course catalog, they have a collection development sequence that has four uh, self-paced classes in it. They have a technical services sequence which also has four self-paced classes in. They have a collection management piece, and these aren't all connected, but they have 27 different things that fit under collection management that are self-paced courses that you can go in and watch. And then they have seven different um, classes that are on digital collections. So again, I think they've got some really great resources if you just wanna spend time on your own and dig into any of these topics a little bit further. And I can't do collection management with, without talking about Nancy Pearl and Booklist. Um, she is the Seattle librarian who is known for her love of books. She sits down each month with authors, poets, and other literary figures for conversations about books, reading, the process and art of writing. Um, this is another really good way to keep your finger on the pulse of what's new and interesting. She also has her own action figure, which is really cool. 
So that was kind of the selection piece um, of that circle that we did. And now we're going to head into some of those strategies and we're going to head to the next part, which is the purchasing piece. So if you go down here, we, whoops, down here, sorry, we did selection and now we're going to head into purchase. This chart seems a little complicated for purchasing books. Um, I think this might be for a very large library with a lot of departments. So although acquisition procedures can vary depending on your mission and your resources, all libraries have some goals in common. We want to acquire materials as quickly and economically as possible. And we want to minimize the amount of paperwork, filing, and follow-up that's needed. So we're going to focus on just a couple of these in our acquisition piece here. We're going to think about choosing a vendor placing your order, bookkeeping, and then processing. And we're not going to spend a whole lot of time on processing. Well, I've lost my mouse. There we go. So first, I want to take a look at choosing your vendor and actually placing that order. The first choice for most items should be your primary vendor like Baker & Taylor or Ingram. If your regular vendor isn't an option, then you might think about an online or an in-town bookstore. The ultimate decision regarding the source depends on a lot of variables that need to be weighed by the director. Since cost is usually a major factor, that's the reason we suggest that it's best if you do your staff purchasing from standard vendors like Baker and Taylor or Ingram, because discounts there are between 40 and 45%. So that's why we recommend that as sort of your first choice, those regular vendors. But what other factors might you consider when you're trying to choose? Think about speed. How fast do they deliver? Cost. What are their hidden costs and their upfront costs? Do you pay for shipping? The ease of the ordering process. How much time and hassle is it going to be for you to get that order off? Uh, what's their return policy? Do they provide cataloging and processing? Do they have a standing order plan? Do they have an online database to order from? Do they provide you things in a variety of formats? So you want to think about those and then maybe rank them. Which are the most important things to you as you're choosing this vendor? So then as we move on, as you place the order, you need to think about what kind of bookkeeping you need to actually do to keep track of the materials, the invoicing piece, and your payment. If you've got an automated system, this step can be made a lot easier, but sometimes a simple spreadsheet can just help you keep track. So you're gonna need to send your uh, order off to your vendor. These are kind of the steps that we go through here. You know, send your order off to your vendor. At this point, you can go into your catalog as on order so your patrons know that it's coming. Again, rem remember we talked about getting the, the March uh, or the April catalog as early as the middle of February. So you can get those things ordered, put them in your catalog, and now patrons know what's coming and they can find them in placeholds. When the books arrive, you open the box and check them off against a packing slip. Then you kind of compare what was ordered and you know make sure there's no obvious damage. Then you should be able to see, are there items on back order? Are there things that are out of stock? And when you should be getting those? Because I guarantee you, those patrons are gonna be asking, you know, this is in your catalog. How come it didn't come? If you've looked at that packing slip, you can say it's on back order from the publisher and we'll get it at whatever time they have told you then. Um, you're going to, you know, put the information in the books where you got it from, how much it costs, because ultimately that's going to go into your catalog record. You're going to check the invoice when it comes against that packing slip. Then you're going to need to think about coding. Where does the money come from? Remember when we talked about budgeting, some libraries do have separate lines for audiobooks, for um, AV materials or children's materials or however you break those down. So you're going to want to think about coding those. And then finally, you're going to pay based on what your city policies are and how they ask you to actually do that. All right, how am I doing? Ooh, I'm getting close. So now we're going to head into sort of the cataloging and processing piece, and we're not going to spend a whole lot of time here, but collection development really does have a lot to do with your technical services operations. Cataloging is all about access. Patrons need to be able to find a book in your catalog and on your shelf. So there are some things to think about as you're planning the process for cataloging and processing. What do you do to your materials to make them more accessible? 
So as part of that, we think about processing and labels. Um, one of the things I wanted to talk about eventually, which I don't think we'll have time for today, is the whole idea of um, genres. And do you put labels on them, like the picture off to the right there, and interfile them? Or do you have them separated into their own section? And if we've got time, we can sort of throw some things up in chat about that. Another thing that I think sort of impacts your selection here is the timing. In what order are things processed once they arrive and why? Um, are you thinking about, is it easier for staff or are you meeting the needs of your patrons? So when materials come in, is it what gets here first, gets cataloged and processed first and gets out the door first? Or is it the last thing that came in, goes out the door first? Is it the easiest things first and the problems later? Um, you want to think about a standard set of priorities. Maybe you decide anything that comes through that's got a hold on it gets done first. So think through those um, ideas as, you're, as your books are coming in and you're working through that uh, processing piece. Um, this, I, I'm, again, I'm sure you can't read um, any of these on here. I pulled this from Novelist because when we wrote this description, we talked a little bit about genres and there's not a whole lot that we can talk about except for that idea of do you separate them out or not. Novelist breaks these down into this many categories. Um, in Under romances, there are 16 different types um, of romances. They have one called category romances, contemporary romances, fantasy romances, futuristic romances, Georgian romances, Gothic romances. They break them down into ever smaller and smaller um, categories and, and former genres. So there's a whole lot of them. Um, this actually can be really useful as you're thinking through reader's advisory services, as you're trying to get at, you know, somebody comes in and says they like romances. Maybe they like futuristic romances. Maybe they like Victorian romances. Maybe they like Western romances. Um, Reader's advisory and collection development are certainly closely tied. So again, I think this is something just to be, to investigate. Um, but I thought this was, that's a whole lot of categories. Um, so this is where, if you want to stick some notes into chat, do you catalog your items separately and pull them out and you have a collection of romances so that your readers can go to the romance section and just look there? Or do you sticker them um, and put things in the catalog, uh, you know, tags, so that they can go to the general shelves and find some of those. I have seen articles that talk about both um, very vigorously and vehemently that one is better than the other. I have talked to librarians who said, this is how my patrons want it. I've talked to librarians who had it one way and flipped to to the other way. So if you've got any comments on that, I'm always fascinated by the differences in how libraries um, choose to do that. All right, I'm gonna get my clock out here so that I can keep going. So use, um, again, this is, if you've been in any sessions with me, you always hear this, something I learned a long time ago, Pareto's 80-20 rule, which didn't come from the library field, but it does have lots of uses in libraries. The rule states that a small number of causes is responsible for a large percentage of the effect. So when we're thinking about library collections, that may mean 20% of your books account for 80% of your circulation. I want you to think about that. And what does that mean as you're selecting? If 20% of what you select is going to be 80% of your circ, how does that impact what you're selecting as you move forward? Um, the whole point of collection development is this part of the cycle, use. If we've carefully selected the right titles, our use should be high. But sometimes we guess wrong, and that's okay. Don't worry about making those mistakes. Librarians are constantly evaluating their choices. Collection management is the continuous process of analyzing use, age, condition, timeliness, and how well you've got items or collections covered. Um, this is another one that's part of that collection management. Um, it doesn't end once that item is on your shelf. The collection needs to be maintained in order to ensure that it's meeting your customer's needs. So these are the pieces to that. 
Um, we always want to think about weeding. We want to think about repair. Think uh, there's a couple of things there for, from repair. Think about preservation. Um, when we're talking about fiction, for the most part, you're not having to preserve those, those fiction titles because think about permanence. Is this something that is going to be in our collection for a long time or not? So as you're kind of putting those materials out there, those are some of the things that I want you to, to think about that. Remember that today, library collections tend to be disposable. So putting a lot of time into these pieces um, aren't always the best use of your, of your time. And that takes us to our very last one, and that is disposal. And we don't need to sit down and, and look at all these one at a time. But yes, indeed, our collections are. We select the books. The final piece of that is when they're no longer usable and we have to get rid of it. So we started with policy. We moved through that life cycle of a book. We highlighted the selection piece of that and we ended with disposal. So I wanna invite you, look at there, I got three minutes left, to take a look at the State Library um, Education YouTube channel, as well as Iowa Learns, because we've got several things that are in there for you. The ones on the left are a collection development series that we, or a, a weeding series that we did called Collection Cultivation. Um, they go into a little bit more depth on some of these topics. And then if you're interested, you don't need to necessarily take the endorsement classes, but we've got a series of four endorsement things that you can actually see on YouTube, where again, we go a little bit more into that idea of um, collection development. And the last thing I wanna tell you about is this was the first in a series of four. Um, Marianne Mori is coming up with um, selection for nonfiction, and then she's got one on marketing your, your collection. And then the final one is gonna be a panel of people whose main job is uh, uh, selection. So hopefully they have some really great tips and tricks that they're gonna be able to share with you. Those are always really popular. I'm really excited to hear um, all of the things that they have to share. I've got six librarians from around the state who are gonna be sharing that. So there is my contact information. I'm gonna stop sharing and Sam, I made it in under an hour, but that's not a whole lot of time for questions. Anything that came through that's fun and interesting? Uh, under an hour. Um, barely. Barely. By this, <laughs> by the skin of your teeth. I did want to point out on the, uh, you talked about um, purchasing diverse books for adults. There were a couple of resources that came through oh, in chats. Thank you. Um, if you hang there, on to those for me. Sure, sure. There is a website called IndieBound, which is um, independent booksellers that often have their pulse, the finger on their finger on the pulse of Great. Um, of uh, sort of alternative resources. And then Baker and Taylor does have a um, diversity and inclusion sort of resource list as well. Okay. Uh, so if you head to their front page, uh, the uh, you should be able to find a diversity and inclusion sort of link there great um lots of interesting comments in the chat about what gets separated out uh it seems to me like this really depends on the library so we've got one yeah. library saying they separate out mystery and westerns another one saying christian fiction only gets separated out biographies are separated out which of course would be nonfiction. um then we go all the way down to separate sections for fictions, mystery, science fiction, romance, but only the mass market romance, westerns, uh, then urban fiction also um, another I'm, one. I'm so, fascinated because it definitely does depend on the library. I've seen it and people are passionate. When I talk to them, it's like, this is the only way it's going to work in my community. So yes. I'm, I'm just fascinated by that. Yeah. Holiday, um, holiday books pulled out in another oh, library. Sure. Um, Ankeny Kirkendall, which of course would be a larger library, um, due to the fact that so many books cross genres, right? Like, is this a romance or is it historical fiction? Uh, which one should I put it in? Um, they ended up uh, interfiling a lot more than they used to. Um, but it seems like in That's general, people are, are happy with the change. Um, they don't, and they don't st even sticker them in the, in the thing. All right, let me see here. Um, you have separating other languages. Yep. And then everything else is a, a bunch of 
of thank yous. So I think this is good. Right. Do folks be on the lookout for those handouts and inter in I almost said handouts and interlibrary loan. We will not ILL them to you, but we will <laughs> put them in Iowa Learns. So look in Iowa Learns for the handouts and the slides. Um, these are just uh, such great resources to have on hand. Do join us next week for purchasing nonfiction. I put that link to register in the chat. I'll put it in one more time. Uh, we hope to see you next week for the nonfiction. Um, if you attended a webinar with Marianne a couple of years ago on a similar topic, um, it will be kind of a refresh and update of what was presented there. Um, I think there's going to be lots of great new uh, new things to think about. So uh, thanks for coming today. My thanks to Becky for uh, this excellent presentation. Everyone enjoy the rest of your Tuesday. Take care. Thanks, everybody.